All right. Thank you guys for showing up. My name is Douglas Santos, and I'm a security strategist for Fortinet's FortiGuards Threat and Research Group. Uh, my main responsibility is uh, connecting with the backend teams, everybody that the development is, is, is right now working on it, understanding exactly how it works, uh, digesting it and <laughs> producing basically a PowerPoint that can be used to communicate how these technologies are working, both to our field sales engineering teams, our partners, our customers in any events like this one. Well. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about one of, the, one of our newest systems, which is a system that was built to tackle a very common cybersecurity uh, issue that nowadays everybody seems to be talking about, which is the shortage of cybersecurity professionals on the field. If you guys think that it's difficult to find a security analyst, a guy who can uh, write a secure code, Imagine trying to find reverse engineers, low-level programmers, ASIC designers, guys who can understand and do thread emulation and understand how to get a, a packet capture and understand how they can reverse engineer that communication protocol to uh, come up with a botnet signature of some sort. So we, this is, this is a, a, a challenge that we as, as, a, as a security vendor, we struggle so much uh, because it is way harder to find this kind of professionals. Okay? And uh, the self-evolving detection system is, uh, is a system aimed at providing contextual and valuable information to our, our antivirus analysts. It is basically a machine learning system that is able to uh, automatically, as malware's, malware is flowing into, into the system, identify which features or which obse observables on Word documents, PDF documents, and executable documents uh, such as P and, uh, and executable files from, from Linux, such as the ELF format, try to understand what kind of uh, malicious uh, f features they encounter on the malware is deemed malicious. And it does this by static analysis and by running the code. Uh, if any of you guys have already seen uh, executable uh, on an on a Oli debugger, on an immunity debugger, you see that there's a topology to the, to the executable. And uh, each, each block of that, of that uh, topology is what we call an assembly engram, is a piece of code. So uh, uh, this, uh, this is what we emulate and we record uh, the, the, memory, uh, the memory results and the register results of that piece of code. And we, with, on top of that information, we, 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 we combine that information with uh, what we've seen on, on, on terms of other executables that, was, that were uh, identified as malicious. Is that feature that I'm looking at this uh, file right now has been tagged as malicious by some other uh, f uh, malicious uh, sample that I've seen. So the, the system has come, uh, was, was invented to deal with the ongoing complexity and volume of malware that we're receiving today. If you, if you think about the first, the first, uh, the first, uh, first malware and the first antivirus solutions, there are only hashes, right? And that's, that really does not scale. If you think about, you gotta get a hand of the sample, you gotta calculate the hash, you gotta update your antivirus signature, you gotta push that to your customer. So it's a very reactive and non-scalable approach uh, by itself. So, um, we invented a technology called Content Pattern Recognition Language. It's basically uh, an algorithm that was made to deal with the, with the polymorphic nature of, of malware. So if you think about it, uh, I have a, uh, an EXE that's a, as a virus. If I pack it or, or zip it with a RAR or a zip file, it will change the hash of the file. Okay? So now we have um, dozens of, of packers, even commercial ones, and, and and, uh, and ones that are freely available. So what the, what one, of the main comp one of the main things that malware authors do is obfus obfuscate the, their code. So they can ob obfuscate it by running into a packer or zipping it into a password protected file. So that basically changes this approach. So if you, if you get a, a, sam a virus sample and you do a virus signature of it and you zip it, the, the hash will obviously be different. So content pattern recognition language is basically present on the 40 client and the 40 gate. And it, it, what, what it can do is that it has uh, more than 32,000 Windows APIs that are hooked. So uh, at the moment that a zipped file or even a password protected zip file with a virus is passing inside a 40 gate, the 40 gate is able to emulate uh, the zip and the libraries that zip uses on Windows so it can unpack the, the virus as it's passing through the wire and uncompress the virus 
to a memory location and then run our dynamic algorithm to see if behaviors uh, seen on that file is, uh, is present, if that file is a, is a malware or not, or not, even if it's on a zip file, even if it's password protected or packet or any sort. Okay? So we, 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 we went from a reactive to a proactive instance uh, in 2020, 2010, 2010 when it started. 2012, we were granted the patent for this uh, the algorithm. But it's still not enough, okay? Uh, CPRL v1, uh, which is uh, the, patent, the patented algorithm, uh, it, it helps us by, uh, we can only do one signature, and that signature, if it's really well uh, written, and if, it's, if it really is, uh, captures all the malicious, malicious features of one family of, of virus, it can catch dozens of thousands of other virus that are utilizing those same feature with the same signature, okay? But that's, that's not enough. Uh, the amount of signature that our, our analysts were, were, were producing when we invented auto CPRL generation two was close to five, uh, 500 to, to 2,000. And that's a lot of work for our virus, virus analysts. So we created a uh, system that automatically identifies uh, the maliciousness of a file and writes a signature for it, and then automatically tests the signature against the clean files and all the, all the other malicious files to see if they're triggering false positives or not. But even so, <laughs> uh, that was not enough, okay? We, we needed a way to uh, understand how those features are changing and uh, be put in machine learning and deep learning algorithms to the test, okay? So uh, uh, artificial intelligence, one of the first people that conceptualized that, that think about, about uh, AI was uh, Alan Turing, okay? And he, he seems to think of, uh, of, a, of a computer that could learn uh, as kind of an infant mind. Because if you think about it, when a baby is first born, when he opens his eyes, he, all he sees is kind of shapes, uh, sounds that he doesn't really understand what it is, but he's, he's trying to make a sense of this. So he opens his eyes and he sees like a, a round shape object and then kind of a rectangular shape object together. And that kind of seems like a human. So that's, that's how he conceptualized that a uh, machine could, 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 could in indeed learn. And uh, his first work uh, was with uh, Maculud, uh, no, was with Clerk, uh, Church and Clean. And uh, basically he was trying to prove that the logical computing machine, which is the Turing machine, was able to carry on and uh, identify anything that could be identified as a rule of thumb. So for instance, if I can identify that this is a chair, if I get a computer and I train it enough, he will identify that a chair has some uh, observable characteristics, and if I put them together, I would then be possible to identify that as a chair. So anything that could be identified as a rule of thumb, he proposed that a machine could also be, be doing that. And that was his first work, it was in 1936, um, while he was working at London. But then uh, other researchers starting, started to get uh, really interested in this topic. And McCulloch and Pitts, they created the formal definition of, uh, of the neurons that uh, Turing had, had uh, proposed. And they started uh, is, uh, elaborating it a little bit more. And they come up with the, um, with the, the, the concepts of inhibitory and, and excitatory si signals, meaning that uh, once once a signal uh, reaches a mutually uh, a perceptron, it could even get, get uh, increased or decreased in, in strength, depending on the analysis of that, of that neuron. And in the 1950s, uh, the, uh, the Dartmouth College uh, formally found a discipline of AI, which obviously, <laughs> soon enough, uh, the AI uh, had, um, had uh, got a lot of interest from the military. Uh, there was a very interesting, um, interesting uh, study that they've done. One of the first approaches to the military is making sure that a computer was able to <coughs> differentiate a tank from a tree. So they got all, uh, all of the tank photos that they had, all of the tree photos that they had, and they started training the system. And they, okay, now, now I, I can see that uh, with the training set and with the testing set, uh, my system can identify 96% of, of of, of trees and tanks, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of good. Let's now open to the world and see how accurate this system is. And now, now they stumble on the first problem of machine learning, which is have a, a, a really huge amount of data. 
So when they opened to, this, uh, to the public, uh, it was a failure because uh, they realized that most of the photos that they had from tanks were, were taken on a, on a black sky, and most of the photos of trees were, were taken with a clear sky. <laughs> so if you had a, a tank with a, with a clear sky, the, the algorithm would get messy. So uh, that led to the first AI winter, uh, where most of the expectations that were set during the initial, initial uh, uh, research were unsubstantiated. They didn't have the data, they didn't have the processing power. So it was up into the 1980s with the proliferation of expert systems in, in LISP that this uh, took another, another shot, that uh, academia and, and military and specifically uh, medical diagnosis systems were starting to use this technology. And today uh, it is uh, way faster for a machine to identify if someone has a case of breast cancer or color, colon cancer by, by just by looking at the image than, uh, than a human. They're way precise and they're way fast. Okay? Um, and then uh, as, as we are, we are we're having more computing power and more data according to, uh, uh, that's, that's basically due to the internet, we now have an uh, enormous amount of data if, if, if we want to. Uh, that led to uh, EBM uh, Watson def defeating Geopard champion Brad Rudin and Ken Janis. That was a huge thing because if you think about it, uh, geopardy questions are somewhat, somewhat riddled, uh, they're, far, they're formed kind of, kind of funny and they give, they give uh, uh, space for double inter interpretation. So that was uh, really something that uh, was kind of impressive. And uh, now it's 2015, we, we have more than 2,200 AI projects uh, at Google. One of them is pretty interesting. Uh, you know YouTube videos, they have tags. Right? If you can, can say, oh, I want to see videos of cats or videos of uh, cars or anything. Uh, now, uh, Google has a, has a project to identify on YouTube videos pictures of things. And then you can auto-tag them so you can search them better. So it's just uh, uh, one, of the, one of the examples of how AI is, is used nowadays. Well, well, nowadays, one of the most uh, things that use AI is video games. Right? You guys are probably aware of that. So machine learning uh, basically works in two branches, okay? Uh, supervised machine learning uh, in which you must first train your system and then you test it. So uh, you build a system using any kind of algorithms that you, that you, that you want. You can use random forest, support vector machines, or the multi-layer perceptron, there are others. But when you're going to train the system, you gotta label it. So uh, let's say that I'm training a machine learning algorithm that does antivirus detection. When I'm training the system, I got a label. So this is, this is my malicious samples. This is a, these are my clean samples. And after the system is trained, you can then say, uh, send them a, sa a set of uh, unlabeled samples and based it on, on the observation that it had on the training phase, you then try to infer how many of these samples that you're testing are malicious or clean, okay? And then we have unsupervised machine learning. That is basically having a, bo a whole bunch of data and looking at this data and trying to find similarities between them. Okay. So uh, we use both of these, uh, of these, um, these types of algorithms. This one we use for malware, uh, for, uh, to identify if a file, if a file is malicious or clean. And this one we use to group them into families. Okay. So as I talked to you guys, uh, we are using supervised learning and clustering. Uh, we also use uh, a little bit of dimensionality reduction uh, that's basically reducing the number of variables on a sum. So uh, for instance, when you remember I talked to you guys about uh, opening up the, the assembly of, the, of, the, of the, an executable file, for instance, and then when you look at the assembly and grams, you have the, the operands, you have the registers, but some, sometimes you may have memory regions or even some, some variables there that must be normalized, right? I cannot really uh, make sure that this assembly and gram, if it's used by another virus, gonna be the same memory location, same, same register, same everything. So we basically get, get those assembly and grams and we, took, we take off everything that can change. So we normalize it, we reduce the features and use the hash of it so that we can store uh, and have scalability. Okay, don't, have, don't run into scalability issues 
so fast. And then we have uh, as well reinforcement learning. We're not actually using this one, uh, but we, we, have, we have plans to start using. So how does machine, uh, machine learning work? I, I find this slide very useful because people who do, don't have any exposure to machine learning or artificial intelligence, they can get the, the aha moment, okay? So this is exactly how our, our system works in a high, high level uh, interpretation. So let's, let's play a game and try to guess what is the thing, okay? So uh, it's an animal, okay? Uh, it's a mammal has four legs, it has gray fur. I know it's not gray, but <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> now it, ha it weighs about, about 10 pounds. It has a short tail. Now it could, have, could be like a fox or I don't know, what else? A hamster. A hamster. Okay. And now it has long ears. It could be a rabbit, right? So this is exactly how the machine learning works. It's, it's, it's using specific observ observables on the file to try to understand if, okay, this is a malicious or this is a clean file, okay? It could be a hair, right? Not a bunny as well. So, and, and a hair has, has shorter ears. I, actually, I'm thinking this is a hair. It's not a bunny, but you, know, you get the idea. <laughs> So what we are using on uh, the self-evolving detection system is what we call the multi-layer perceptron. It's, uh, it's, it, it has four layers right now. So we have an input layer, a malicious layer, and a clean layer, and the decision layer. So the input layer is basically trying to figure out what kind of file it is. Is it a Word document? Is it a PDF document? Is it a packet file? It is just a regular EXE or an ELF, uh, an ELF file. When it decides that, then it knows to which uh, layer it will, it, will, it will send the file, okay? So the, 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 the layers are responsible for identifying specific ob observables within the files and, and ser are searching for them in, within the files, okay? Each, uh, each layer has nodes and each of these nodes has weights. Uh, the weight can change during system operation regarding how many of the files deemed as malicious or clean had that feature. So the more malicious files that we see that has this specific feature, the more that feature weights. So if a, if a file is, is found to have that malicious feature that was seen like 10, or 10 other times, then it's more likely to be malicious, okay? So the multilayer perceptor behavior is similar to human arrows. If the input is strong enough, the signal is passed. If not, uh, it, will, it, will, it won't have any, any form of, of, of signal uh, enhancement. So uh, for, I, 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 talk, I talked about this a little bit before. So Fortinet knew that uh, the malware, the malware uh, issue is not going, going anytime again, going away anytime soon, and it's getting more complex. It's got, it's gotten uh, way more. Um, what I can say, depending on user behavior than anything, and that's really something that's uh, complicated to to trigger on a sandbox, right? Uh, so the idea was to reallocate our researchers on novel areas of, of study, and that will be able, be able be basically to help us uh, go into new directions. Okay. So uh, the Fortinet self-evolving detection systems, as I told you guys, has the malicious and the clean layer. The malicious layer processes about 1.9 billion uh, features, so that's observables that we've seen on the wild on the newest malware samples and 2.9 billion nodes analyzing files for clean <coughs> features. Uh, the, feature, the, 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 the malware will enter and then it, regarding, uh, depending on the type of, of file identified, it will be sent to a specific node within the malicious layer. And then the malicious layer will, will go, okay, is this uh, present? Is the, is the entropy of the text session higher than 10,000? Oh, it is. So, forward this where to this to this other node with this kind of signal and then it it uh, it rolls on okay uh, well feature are just point observable uh, characteristics okay so as as a system is trained as I told you guys all the features are extracted and consolidated into the knowledge base for each for each layer 
And obviously, quality is critical. We cannot just get any kind of sample. Oh, let's just get one million sam malware samples and one, cl one million clean samples. You gotta have the best representation of these samples, okay? If it, if, if, if it only has like one or two features, it is not the best representation. You gotta get a malware that has a bunch of features that that's really uh, has cutting edge, uh, evasive technology, we just cannot uh, one, one big motto with machine learning is garbage in, garbage out. If you're not sure what, how you're training and which, what, which data you're training your system, you won't have uh, a, good, a good result. Okay. So as I said, each feature ha has weights, and that weight is basically dependent on how many, uh, how many clean, malicious, clean or malicious files uh, has that feature in it. So a single instance will work like that. We have the input layer, malicious or clean. And then uh, if that feature is present on, on the file, it will get a score, depending on the, the, the feature, on how, how, how malicious or how clean is that feature, OK? Uh, then it's weighted and pass it forward to the next node. And then the analysis is repeated. It depends on, uh, on, on, on how, how the system, how the, the file initially enters and to where it goes during the system. But if it found like 90%, 90, uh, if it found a, a feature that gives 90 points on the malicious layer, but malicious files have clean features as well. Okay, so it could have like minus 20 and that gives us a score of 70 that goes to the output layer. Okay, and we, de we decide uh, okay, more than 70 or more than 60, it's a malicious, it's a malicious file, okay? It has some maliciousness on it. So uh, the, the way that this, uh, these features and those, these layers are connected can change during system training because doing system training is when uh, the system is aware which files are malicious or not, and they can build relations between uh, those nodes. So if I see this feature, uh, the next uh, assembly engram should be this. And if, then if you find this, this, after then this, then uh, it's more, more likely than uh, the, the, the files is, is really malicious, okay? So uh, the output, as I said, is a result of the calculation of 1.9 billion features on the malicious layer and 2.9 billion features on the clean layer. Not every, every file will go, obviously, to, to all features, depend on, on the observables that were uh, seen first. So layers plus features and nodes equals learning. Okay? So the systems fed initial data sets for analysis. Uh, as, I, as I told you guys, we use the supervised machine learning approach. And uh, obviously, uh, information and then uh, the features are extracted during the learning phase. Uh, that, uh, that is done via static analysis, which is basically opening up uh, the PE file on large PE or other, other, uh, other uh, tools that allow you to see the structure of the PE file. So we have the lab library imports, uh, the information about the PE file structure, so how many sections does it have, what are the entropies of those sections, okay? And we have also behavior patterns that happens during activation. Or we have, we got, any, uh, got every one of those assembly engrams and we run them to see uh, if they are, if, when, when, they, when we run them, uh, they are similar to the, uh, the runtime environment when we run mal other malicious samples as well. And the system learns how to waste the features, okay? If it's seeing those, those features May more and more on malicious files, that means that's, that's in, that thing is really malicious, okay? So, um, yeah, this is a, this is a problem we are, we are getting right now because uh, this feature, 1.9 billion features and plus 2.9 billion features, the system can grow very, very large. So we are back to the, to the first problem on the, on the signature really database. So, what we're doing uh, is using the, only the, the features that are more, more, more seen and more heavily weighted, okay? And we, we are doing this using reinforcement learning. So we do back propagation as well. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, a really good go problem. Uh, so how does this work, okay? 
Uh, first, we start with a, with a self-evolving detection system and an empty feature repository. So uh, we have nothing on the database regarding malicious or clean features. And then uh, we, a training set which malicious and clean features are sent to the system, which then uh, determines uh, which are the information that that we wanna, you want to go for. Okay, this is this information you have to specify. So I want to go after this part of information in the PE file structure. So I want to get these assembly engrams, apply dimensionality reduction, and then uh, f to see if I find this anywhere else and on other on other files. Okay. So uh, and then features are modified as the system learns. Okay, they they go into adapting the weights of the nodes and, and features. And then uh, we do the system testing. Uh, this time we are not labeling any samples. We are just throwing samples at the system and, and saying, hey, uh, based on information that you have acquired on the training phase, see, try to see if any of those features that you have extracted are present on these files that you don't know. Okay. So using the feature repository, all the samples are analyzed. These samples are now unlabeled. Okay. Um, and that, uh, as that occurs, that's uh, what um, uh, where back, back, back some kind of back propagation uh, uh, can occur. Okay, so if they they're seeing that uh, no, I see that this file is malicious, and uh, there's a feature on this uh, this file that is very malicious, but I don't have this feature anywhere. So I'm gonna put this on the on the on the on the features repository. Okay, and then the system the. Uh, determines if the file is clean or, or malicious based on uh, the amount of, uh, the, basically the result that, that's the, the output from the system. Okay. And then uh, if the, out, the output is compared and you see, oh, okay, we, we were expecting to get at least 99.8% accuracy on the system and the system was not. Okay, so let's reset the system, let's uh, see if we can find other features or, or other ways that we can look into this file to, to get uh, the information that we, we want. Okay, so um, this is basically a, a, a diagram that, wor that, that shows how the system works. So malicious, obviously malicious uh, files will get uh, treated by the malicious layer and clean files will get clean, uh, treated by the clean layer. And then this information during training phase is extracted to the malicious or the clean, clean layer. And as the system evolves, uh, the, quality, the feature set uh, stabilizes. Okay? And, the, uh, the, and, the, uh, and how much we, we trust that features obviously is, uh, increases because we're seeing more and more and more of that feature present on malicious databases. Okay? So uh, we continue to have a high degree of confidence as, as the system matures and evolves. Okay. Uh, today uh, we are using SAS to augment the pattern recognition and automatic signature creation because one problem that we're seeing is that uh, okay we, we identified a new malware family today and we we build a, a, a signature to get all the all the malware families uh, most of the the, the the malwares that are on this family but as time goes by this malware family may get, may get the, some of these features uh, used in another malware, and you, uh, one year or six years from now, you'll see that that original signature is not ca ca catching much more of that malware family because now it's kind of an hour, another malware family and it's using just a bits and pieces of the original file. So with this, uh, with this system in place, we can automatically identify uh, if uh, if a new family is, is sprunging, or if uh, if, a, if a signature is not uh, as 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 eff effective as we wish we would, and basically pinpoint and direct our analysts so they can uh, see what are the, the the signatures that are losing detection and which ones uh, are not, and, mo and more, which features should they be considering when we writing uh, the CPRL signatures? Okay, to better understand. Uh, to, to, uh, to heighten the effect efficacy of the signature, okay? So, uh, the first part is uh, the collection of our global samples. Uh, we are uh, we're processing uh, an average of 7,500,000 7, samples a day, and that comes from our 3 million sensor network uh, and our uh, Cyber Threat Alliance 
and some of the threat feeds that we, we, we have. Uh, the second part is the cross caning. So we have our own virus total. We have uh, partnerships with most antivirus vendors. We have their, their engine. We have, they have our engine. So we just try to uh, understand oh, if other, other vendors are having detection, we are not, and that kind of helps us direct uh, our efforts. And then, uh, the, then comes the content pattern analysis, which is basically the auto CPRL uh, basic, uh, creating, dynamically creating a signature and trying to see if that signature is effective. And then the last part is the uh, SADS, which basically is looking at the, the raw amount of virus that we're receiving, understanding which features are more, are more malicious or not, and giving that back to the auto CPRL so that it can create an automatic signature based on the most malicious features. So, and that, uh, that will end up uh, on our antivirus database as a 40 gate and 40 client and the 40 sandbox. So this is uh, how we are doing today. And that is received as uh, AV signatures updates to our global customer database. Well, that, uh, that was all I have. I think we, we have a few, that was 30 minutes. We have 15 minutes left for questionings. Uh, two, uh, one is actually, is there a way to get that slide that can be uh, yeah. by email or whatever? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Second, um, you kept mentioning uh, malicious files or yes. malicious whatever. Is there a way to find these without having to actually search them on any? Uh, you do have some very, very, very good sites that you can download malware, malware samples from. Uh, hybrid analysis. If you have uh, an account on uh, on VirusTotal, you can you can download some samples. Uh, we have like almost half a petabyte of, of virus samples, and we can uh, <laughs> we can leverage these to to build a very good machine learning model. So that's that's the whole idea. Have the good day. Uh, no, it was sorry. <laughs> but I can I can send you the, the presentation. Yeah, no problem. Can you talk about sandbox in the in the in order to analyze it? Mm -hmm. uh, has there been issues with the recent uh, rather serious CPU vulnerabilities that have surfaced? Where your sandbox is considered assembly that happens to be capable of reading what the CPU itself is. Yeah. What we did is that we don't actually we don't use a sandbox per se. We use the content pattern recognition language, which is kind of a real-time sandbox, but it doesn't really it does really have a CPU attached to it. But all syscalls are are, prox are new proxy. So we don't actually do anything. We just respond yes or no. So the, the unpacking routine can, can go on, and we can extract the, 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 the malware and the, the information to memory so, that we, so then we can search for patterns. So we're not running a sandbox. But, but uh, to your point, the 40 sandbox today is one of the most uh, problematic uh, issue, uh, network, uh, the network security devices on the, on the company because it is executing code, right? And one of the premises of the meltdown inspector is that you were able to execute code. So <laughs> that's, um, that's really problematic. And so yeah, that's a bit of a follow-up. Yeah, yeah. If it's not truly a sandbox, is that possibly open the door for the ability to miss certain exploits. Yeah. It does miss some. It does yeah. miss some. Yeah. It's not at all 100%. Uh, but I mean, yeah. it would have no capability of, of detecting Spectre or Meltdown or anything like that. Before, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The only, the only thing that I see that uh, zero-day exploits, zero-day exploit, not exploitation techniques, can be uh, kind of mitigated is by using anti-exploit technologies, where you have this group of, uh, group of vulnerability types, such as buffer overflow, heap overflow, off by one record, um, off by one error, race conditions. And on top of that, even a single vulnerability on, on modern endpoint won't be able to, to trigger anything because you have DAP, you have NH NX, you have SLR. So 
NC Exploit Technologies help by looking into processes and seeing if programming errors or even such, such things as uh, trying to disable DAP or NCs or any security measures is happening on our system. So that way, even if it's a zero day vulnerability and it's using a known vulnerability type, it can be at least mitigated or, or, or detected. But if it's, if it's a new vulnerability type, then you're off to monitoring and analytics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one of the most interesting things from, 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 from our system is something that is still in development and it's called the Human Experience Accelerator. So using that database of features, we have this, uh, developed an IDA plugin and where our analysts are alerted of the samples that had somewhat uh, between a lot of malicious features and a lot of clean features. This is where they're focusing now. And so they open up the IDA plugin and we can see all the features that the system has identified and the ones that he wasn't sure. And then the analyst can say, oh no, this is a malicious feature. And then it, the, the system has another, another module to observe the analyst and learn from it. So this is, this is a feedback loop that's uh, still in development, but it's very, very promising. Because now we, we put the human analysts into the, um, into the mix, and then ma now the machine is able to understand what he's doing, observe, and then if it happens again, then the system will take care of itself. Um, aren't you worried at all about your uh, sample? How are you saying model over training? Because uh, <coughs> not malware in particular, typically uh, as they produce new malware, they try to make it look more and more like you know proper software. And some of those features that we're currently waiting during that week could potentially end up being the exact features that they try to incorporate into theirs to make their software look clean. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you counteract that? You gotta retrain every three weeks. We're retraining the system, so so we have we have we have two systems. One that's actually uh, was trained three weeks ago and is actually uh, operating, and then we are having another one being trained, and then we switch them. Yeah, because other, otherwise it will. It's not like a, a system that you can train and forget about it. Just because there, there's so many changes in malware, and it's it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I guess you are getting better and more sanitized data every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. feeding it into a reading would then be better than it was three weeks ago. Questions? Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you.